Hello, my, uh, so my name is Pierre Mounier. I'm Associate Director of Open Edition, and I have the honor to, to chair and moderate uh, this panel of, uh, on uh, Open Peer Review. In fact, it's the first time I'm playing this game, so I'm a little bit stressed, and uh, I will ask you to, to be nice with me <laughs> and <laughs> forgive my, uh, my mistakes if I, if I make some mistakes. So, as Anthony said, uh, four speakers were planned, but unfortunately, unfortunately Andrew Preston uh, couldn't make it due to transportation problems. But our three other speakers are there, uh, ready to discuss the hot topic, which is uh, that is uh, open peer review. So I suggest that we start, and we are going to start with uh, uh, short presentations from each of the speakers about what they do and what, in their opinion, is the main challenges uh, that we are facing with Open Peer Review. And then I'll tell you, after the presentations, how we are going to organize the discussion. So we are going to start with Stephanie, and during your walk to the computer, I will present you, Stephanie, okay? <laughs> it's a show. It's like a TED conference with a headset, so. Uh, but we are seated, that's a difference. So Stephanie is the medical editor at Biomed Central. Uh, after gra graduating, she worked in hospital clinic practice before joining Biomed Central in 2010. And Stephanie is also, and I think it's the most important thing here, co-editor-in-chief of Research Integrity and Peer Review at Biomed Central. So, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about um, what I see as the challenges of um, open peer review. But just to give you um, um, a little bit of background um, first as to what I do and how I'm involved in open peer review. So I work um, in a small group at Biomed Central called the Research Integrity Group, and I'm the medical editor, which means that I work across um, our medical journals that we publish. And so we define our editorial policies, um, make sure that our editorial policies are um, current and up to date. Um, and we also work with our editors to help them apply those policies. We look at our peer review policies and we help them um, with any difficulties um, they may have um, with a particular manuscript relating to publication ethics or maybe any uh, peer review um, issues that may arise. And we also provide training for our editors. And so I work um, across a uh, lot of journals that have different, that publish on different models of peer review. Um, many of our journals um, operate on a single blind model, but we have a, a fairly large amount of journals that operate on an open peer review model, um, particularly our medical journals. And so one journal that I'm particularly involved in is a very um, new journal, uh, which we launched uh, last month called Research Integrity and Peer Review. Um, and I'm one of the editors in chief of this um, journal. And we aim to publish um, research um, into uh, research integrity, the, the publication process, and to peer into peer review to try and build up the evidence base um, that there's, is around here. Um, and obviously, we operate an open peer review model um, on this journal. And I've also been involved in conducting some research um, into the peer review process, um, looking at the quality of reports on open peer review um, and closed peer review. And so I thought as we've been using open peer review to cover so many different um, meanings and, and topics here, I thought I would just explain that when I'm talking about open peer review in terms of the open peer review that I'm experienced in working in, I'm talking about pre-review open peer review that involves two levels of openness. So the authors know who the reviewers are, who is reviewing their papers, and then if that article is accepted for publication, the reviewers' signed reports, along with the authors' um, responses to those reports, will be published um, online um, and available to readers. So I've just picked an example of an article here that's been published with Open Peer Review, um, and you can see that there's a, a link to the Open Peer Review report, which you can click on and read um, the reports from that. So, um, the, we have um, a series of journals called the BMC, ser BMC series, which spans um, medicine and biology. There's approximately 60 journals in it. And um, approximately 40 of those journals are medical titles, and all of the medical titles have operated um, on an open peer review model following this system that I've just described um, since they were launched. So some of them have actually been operating on this model um, for 15 years. So we feel it's quite an established model because we've been able to, um, to run this um, open system on those. So when I was asked about the challenges of open peer review, I thought, oh, open peer review works. It works on the journals I, I work on. Um, so 
what are the challenges. But then I thought that actually in this room, we're all very um, in agreement that open peer review is a good thing for its benefits um, on transparency, reducing bias, accountability. But actually when you go out into the broader um, community and speak to researchers, a lot of them are very anti open peer review. They like to hide behind the an anonymity. Um, they think that no one will agree to review a paper if, um, if, if, it's, um, if the reports are being signed, that the reviewers won't be able to be honest, they'll never be able to provide a negative report, you won't be able to reject um, manuscripts. And actually when um, large scale surveys are, do are done of researchers, um, the model that comes out um, as their preferred model is actually double blind peer review, um, which is obviously quite different to the, um, the open peer review model. So I'm hoping that we can kind of discuss ways to change, um, to change attitudes and convince people of the benefits of open peer review. And then I think underpinning some of these problems is the other challenge is the lack of evidence. Um, there's a lack of evidence into open peer review, but I think actually it's fair to say there's a lack of evidence into peer review itself as to whether it works, what models work best, um, and whether, as I think is more likely to be the case, different models are needed for different specialties, different communities, um, and what really works best. So um, thank you, and I will pass over to the uh, next panelist. Thank you, Stephanie. So now I give the floor to Alexander Grossman. Alexander is the uh, founder and president of Science Open. Until uh, 2001, he was researcher and associate professor in physics at the University of Tübingen before he decided to join publishing industry at Wiley. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, before he got an appointment as professor of publishing management in 2013, Alexander spent five years at Springer and De Greuter as managing director and vice president publishing, respectively. Is it correct? Okay, Good. so Alexander, thank the you. floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. The amazing uh, thing is that when I was at Springer, uh, that was 2008, it was just the year when Biomed Central was acquired by Springer, and that was a great time because it was the first time that a major publisher was so open yeah, to, to cope with open access and also um, yeah, the CEO of Springer said at that moment uh, at a management meeting in Amsterdam, well, that's a great opportunity for all of us because he was asked at that time, Ooh, why, uh, why shall we go to open access? Why should we open us um, to new kinds of publishing? And uh, yeah, and so it's a, yeah, it was a great experience for myself and um, that was also one of the reasons why I decided then to think about alternatives for both for open access publishing but also for peer review. And just half an hour ago or so, um, Josh explained very accurately how it could work. Post-publication peer review, uh, more transparency in any kind of scholarly communication and this was or is part of Science Open which I launched with a partner of Boston in Boston uh, three years ago, and yeah, and we are, we are ready to find out more um, about the opportunities, um, not only for publishing and scholarly communication, but also for more transparency in the quality assessment of uh, scholarly communication, and this is the topic of our panel discussion today. Um, that's why I want to ask two questions, basically. Um, the first question is uh, how to establish more openness and transparency and peer review in general without, and that's very important, um, and we were carefully listening to Ulrich Prusher this morning, uh, without affecting the quality of that process of scholarly communication. And uh, we, we all know that there are a lot of differences between the communities, um, between humanities, social sciences, and life sciences and medicine, for example, in terms of peer reviewing. Yeah, so there are different ways to assess um, the quality of manuscripts and there are different ways how to publish manuscripts or monographs in different areas. And in the future, uh, I think the borders yeah, will be not as, as clear as in the past. There's more interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary research and as we learned this morning, there are more ways to communicate, not only blogs or other ways to post opinions or yeah, the latest research results. And there are some communities where this has been done quite frequent, uh, frequently. Others uh, yeah, which want to keep or want to stay at the past or at the, the present system 
of peer review. The second question is, um, do we need or do we still need an editorial moderated assignment of reviews for open peer review? Um, because we want to maintain a certain level of quality for the peer review. And I know there's um, a, a, yeah, a great debate, a big debate about this, um, this issue, and there are also some surveys and statistics about opinions of um, scholars about that point, and uh, hopefully we will discuss that issue later on then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And now we are going to listen to uh, Pandelis Perakakis. Uh, Pandelis received a P his PhD degree in cl clinical psychophysiology in uh, 2009. And now he works as a postdoctoral post researcher at the University of Granada in Spain. Uh, in 2012, together with Michael Taylor and Varvara Trakana, he uh, co-founded Open Scholar, uh, which he currently serves as director. Is it correct? Okay. Fandelis. So yes, it's true. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Granada in the area of sports physiology and cognitive neuroscience. And apart from that, I'm also co-founder of this organization, this international organization of volunteer researchers that uh, was born when um, a group of, of friends, of colleagues, got together, driven uh, by the same frustration that uh, <laughs> Ulrich mentioned earlier and tried to discuss about ways to improve a uh, scholarly communication model that we would per we perceiving that was confusing uh, quality with prestige and it was uh, give, offering the wrong incentives to, to researchers to pursue, uh, to, to compete against uh, prestigious publications in journals instead of collaborating to improve the quality of, uh, of science and, uh, and of their work. So that's how we started. Uh, we realized that uh, the, the main the main driver behind this, uh, this model is peer review. So in some way or another, all our initiatives and all our efforts were dedicated to providing uh, innovation in peer review and mainly to develop infrastructure that will um, uh, put forward, that will support a radically, new, a radically different model of peer review. We started by trying to build our own platform that we called Libre. Uh, we had many problems and while we were trying to overcome these pro problems, we realized that somebody else that did something exactly the same uh, as we were trying to do with Libre only better because he didn't, he didn't have the same problems that we were facing. So uh, it was exactly the same in terms of both infrastructure and also principles. So we decided instead of du duplicating efforts that we get together and, uh, and join forces and promote this, uh, this initiative uh, together. So this is the Cell Journal of Science, and which is actually a, a platform. It's a non-commercial repository that um, provides the space where researchers can meet and make peer review a community process without that it's not mediated by any, uh, any third parties, they, they don't need any editors or uh, committees of experts, they just get together and debate about the validity of their own work and by doing that at the same time they, they improve the quality of the work and they receive proper, proper credit for it that they can add to their academic record. Uh, the same idea we tried to, to propose also to institutional repositories. We received the fund funding from Open Air last year and we created a module for this space uh, repositories, for this, this space infrastructure, so that repositories themselves become uh, this meeting space, meeting place of researchers in order to uh, validate and assay, assess each other's work. And at the same time, we participate in a recently formed uh, working group uh, by the Confederation of Open Access Repositories where we, uh, we propose recommendations for the next generation of repositories in order also to become, every repository can become this, uh, this, uh, this platform, an evaluation platform. And uh, I, can, I can assure Josh that uh, sex appeal is one of, our <laughs> one of our points in the agenda of what <laughs> needs to be done. <laughs> so the challenge is the way I see, see them for the future. Uh, first and foremost, to serve quality. There is a, there is a, a stakeholder that is always missing from these uh, groups, which is science itself. We always discuss about what's better for researchers, what's better for editors, for, for reviewers, for publishers, but we tend to forget what's best for science. And sometimes there is a conflict between what's best, uh, what's, what is the best scientific methodology, what is best for knowledge and science, and, uh, and what is best for individual groups. So we have to keep this always in mind, that the, the final that the final aim is to improve the scientific quality. 
and uh, also about the openness, openness, how to define openness. And uh, we, we, we tend to uh, promote openness at all levels that uh, Tony described this, moment, uh, this morning. So it's, uh, it should be uh, public, meaning that uh, open access reviews, the, the text should be public. Uh, transparent, always signed by everybody. Everybody knows who's uh, every every comment and every action on uh, on this on this space is always signed. And it's community. It's not it's not a selective process. Anyone can contribute. Anyone from the research community can com contribute to the to the review process. And also dynamic. Something that was not mentioned. Uh, according to the principle of uh, rational uh, of critical rationalism, science can never be uh, a scientific proposal statement can never be finally. Uh, accepted. It's always under under debate, and this is this is what the nature of peer review should always uh, should uh, also be like. And uh, finally, the infrastructure. In this infrastructure, whatever uh, whatever is the infrastructure for these uh, review services, it should be public. It should be federated. It should be it should be working uh, with open source software, and uh, we should make sure that there is interoperability, so that we don't duplicate the the, uh, the today's um, situation where. What matters most is where you publish, but uh, it, it should be relevant which portal you, you're using to, to review the work. And um, also very important, the governance issue, which is uh, we should find ways uh, th so that nobody controls this new infrastructure. And the best way not to control it is, so that, is, is that everybody controls it. So we have to find ways that uh, this new infrastructure is community governed. Uh, its uh, decisions are made horizontally. There is no uh, olig oligarchy. There is no. There are no decisions that are made by select groups, and uh, that it should be uh, non-profit. So these are the challenges the way I see them, and hopefully we'll discuss about them in the debate. Okay. Now, uh, so. Uh, the four of us, uh, and with uh, Tony and Arvid, who is uh, just sitting here, uh, we prepared a little bit the discussion by email, uh, and we uh, identified six uh, topics uh, through which we are going to go for the discussion. Uh, the first one is obviously uh, very important, is the question of de uh, definition and delimitation of the open peer review uh, uh, topic. Uh, I, I don't want us to take too much time on that because it can be infinite, <laughs> so we will be short on that, but it's necessary. The second one will be, uh, the second topic will be about the relationship with research integrity and the question of quality uh, of research. The third one uh, will be the relationships between open peer review and the rest of the uh, scholarly communication system and particu particularly the publishers. Uh, and after that, we are going to talk about the challenge of the uptake uh, inside the different scientific committees, uh, communities. Um, we will have a short part of the discussion about uh, uh, the recognition of open peer review inside the research evaluation process, uh, how open peer review practices are recognized or not recognized uh, for the uh, careers of the researchers. Uh, and maybe the inst institutions as well. And then, uh, Irina, I don't know where you are, but uh, be confident, we are going to talk about uh, the place of open peer review inside the open science framework, because I think uh, also that's important. So no, <clears throat> let's get back uh, to the question of delimitation and definition. So my first question to the panelists would be, uh, how, do you, how would you define open peer review, but more precisely? I think that there is a difference between commentary and uh, open commentary and open peer review. So what are the relationships between the two of them? So for you, under what conditions, in your opinion, an open commenting frame framework can be considered as open peer review? And on the other side, a peer review process, uh, what are the conditions for a peer reviewing process uh, to be considered as truly open? So, my question to the three of you, who wants to start? Pandelis? You have the mic. <laughs> oh, second one. Okay, so the question is um, the difference between review and commentary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so starting by the, from the definitions, we, I already mentioned that for us, openness is at all levels for, for review. There's, no, uh, there's no, no restrictions in the 
in, in time in uh, the group of uh, the, the, the selection of reviewers so anybody of the community can participate in this process. Uh, what, what, what is the incentive for the reviewer is that his contribution becomes uh, integrated to the article. So whoever reads the article, at the same time he's able to access all the process that has all the process that has contributed to the final version of the article. So this is the, he links, actually he links the name with the, the quality of the article. He becomes a par part of the article. So this is what differentiates uh, a review process where the reviewer becomes a member of the, of, the, of, the, of the team that has produced the article and commentary, which uh, it could be something more light, a lighter version where the comment is not necessarily uh, a significant contribution that requires some revisions from the authors or requires, it could be something more minor, let's say, and it could be done without the intention to become part of the, of the life of the article. This is what we perceive as review versus commentary. So for you, it's based basically on the level of engagement, in fact, of the, part, the, the participants. Okay. Exactly, yes. Alexander, do you agree? Maybe just a quick remark. When I recall my time at the publishing houses where we had so many journals, also um, Premier League or Champion League journals, um, um, some of the reviews we received um, were comments, commentaries following your definition, which is absolutely accurate. Uh, just to recall that also the closed classical peer reviewing is not always that what we assume what it is. Yes, so I think one of the, the key things that I will take home from today is quite how many different things we talk about when we're talking about open peer review. I would say, to me, I, I see open peer review as um, reviewer reports done with names attached to them so people know who those reports are um, and that those reviewers are um, suitably um, qualified to between them to assess the all aspects of, of the manuscript so that a decision um, can be made um, that that article is is deemed sound whether that's done in a pre-publication model or, or a post-publication model but I think maybe we need to be clearer when we talk about open peer review what we're actually meaning by it because I can see that um, the, the commentary after it which which is very important and continues to evaluate the article is also open peer review so uh, maybe, Ulrich, could you uh, answer also the question because I was really interested by your multi-stage open peer review process and maybe you can give your insight about how you see the relationships between the two of them. Well, I found that very, I never thought about this specific question, I have to admit, but now I found it interesting also really, I think this discrimination between peer review contributing to the article, which I stressed was important for us, that you contribute to the final product directly might be a good criterion. Again, there are many forms of review, so I think it's still review, the commenting afterwards, even the citation is a kind of evaluation, right, to go up. But I think if you want to discriminate between peer review and, and commentary, I would, would agree to the proposal uh, of, of contributing to the final product or so. And that might also really help to, to attract people, whether it's, so it's sort of opposite, whether it's anonymous or not, right? I would say if you contribute to the final paper, that's maybe a good way of talking about peer review. But again, this is just loud thinking. <laughs> Maybe just um, a final statement, um, openness, uh, we just described um, open peer review based on the review, the physical review, which means disclosure of both identity of the reviewer and also the report. Um, but there's a second dimension, this is my opinion or not only my opinion, um, also other authors have uh, postulated this as um, uh, Krieger's Court and others. Um, a few years ago, which say, okay, the second dimension of open peer review means openness in terms of who may be the right person or who feels that he or she is the right person um, to submit that review. So that means um, openness, second dimension. Everybody, every expert, to be very precise, is invited to contribute, which is a complete contradiction to the classical peer review where Peer, review, peer reviewers are assigned by editors or in-house editors. So in your opinion, if the reviewers are assigned by editors, uh, then it's not a peer review 
it's only reflecting what the first dimension which we were discussing and I think some authors, um, not the majority, but some authors also say there are two dimensions um, which means really openness then. So no bias because everybody who feels as an expert in a certain area um, yeah, may contribute and not the editor or the editors are deciding who will be or who will become the editor. Absolutely, I think that's a key difference between an, a comment and a, a formal review. You're absolutely right. Yes, just a very small note. Um, the way we see it, uh, a review has to, has to end up with a recommendation. Uh, it always, a reviewer has to end up with a recommendation of whether the, he accepts all the statements in this, uh, in this piece of work or he believes that there should be some revisions, major or minor, in order to be accepted by him. And uh, if, if he decides that there should be some revisions, then he, he should uh, clearly uh, debate why he believes that this is pertinent to the article. So this is another differentiation probably between reviews and comments. You can make a comment without any... Uh, recommendation. Yeah. Mm. Level of engagement and the presence of a recommendation or not. Yeah, the two criteria, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> So let's stop there because uh, we, are, we don't want to go too fast. For uh, let's stop there and maybe uh, switch to the second thematic. So the, the second topic is about research integrity and quality. So we have uh, uh, the idea that the evaluation of research publication is based. The classical evaluation of research publication is based on the assumption that anonymity during the evaluation process guarantees the evaluator's neutrality and the independence of judgment. So my question is, how exactly is open peer review challenged by that assumption? Or how open peer review challenged this assumption, maybe? <laughs> and uh, I, Alexander, I'll take back your own question, which is uh, how to establish more openness and transparency in peer reviewing uh, without affecting the quality of scholar communication? And what are the means, of course, needed to achieve it? Do we need an editorial uh, moderated assignment of reviewers? So, Alexander uh, first, and then the two others. That was my question, yes, but I have no answer. No, I'll try to give an answer. Uh, um, and um, as I said, um, there are good reasons um, to have an anonymous um, peer review, a formal peer review. And um, it, maybe it's interesting to start the discussion with a survey which was um, done by the um, STM, Scientific Technical Medical Organization, a couple of years ago. They were asking uh, thousands of um, researchers um, in different disciplines in that area, uh, in these areas, and um, yeah, they were asking the question, would you um, do any reviewing for any journal if you know in advance that your report and your identity will be disclosed afterwards? And 50% or 51% said, no way, then I won't go for any review at that journal anymore. However, I think 48% said, yes, they would go for a review in a journal where the, the identity of the reviewer and also the report will be disclosed afterwards. And then it was interesting, then the survey asked those who said yes, the second question, why? And that was very interesting, that was an open question, um, so not to tick something. And um, yeah, the answer was very clear. Um, the majority of those who said yes, we would go for an open peer review, um, they said that, it, that they expect at least um, more quality, more quality of the reviews itself. And um, yeah, that was interesting. A lot of more reasons uh, also, um, yeah, credits for the review and so on, but um, the quality issue, that's the issue of my question also, um, the quality issue is I think the most important um, issue for, for quality assessment and scholarly communication and um, um, if you look deeper into that issue you see that um, of course if you are a reviewer um, you will take more care very probably if you know that your name will be posted or published alongside with the final article 
that's quite obvious. Um, with the exception of those who do an excellent job anyway, but as I said, I, I made the experience for so many journals in so many years, that's the minority of reviews which came back to us, um, to the editorial offices, which were brilliant. Very often it was a situation in the close peer review process that you got a report back which said, rejection, no way. The, the next report said, oh, only minor correction needed, um, accepted with minor corrections. What are you doing? And then you had a report like this. Formally, everything was treated, but in that way. So half, per, half a page. And then we asked the third reviewer, which was in, the, in between. So I think that's, that's a problem. And um, that's why I believe that open peer review open peer review in the first dimension, which we were discussing in the beginning, uh, will improve the system, will improve the quality. Um, I just wanted to, to add to that point, say I, um, I agree that um, openness is definitely associated with, um, with better quality people taking more um, care over their reports. And we've actually got some um, evidence um, that, that shows that. The study um, that um, myself and my colleagues um, did last year where we compared um, the quality of reviewer reports um, on a journal that published um, on an open peer review model, uh, BMC Infectious Diseases, and then BMC Microbiology, which is a very similar journal in the same series, similar threshold, um, but um, has closed peer review, we found that the, um, article, that the reviewer reports, when we rated them using um, a tool called the Reviewer Quality um, Index, which is a, a validated tool for assessing reviewer reports, we found that they were slightly better quality on open peer review. And as you would expect, when you looked at the domains on which questions they were scoring better on, it was um, being more polite, substantiating what they were um, saying. So I think this nicely backs up that that, 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 though even if, they're, even if they're making the same bottom line recommendation, that there's more there to really show that that's a, a true assessment um, of that paper. Um, and so the other, other thing I just wanted to mention relating to um, the, the sort of quality of peer review and sort of the integrity of peer review is that I think it's really interesting that when really large scale surveys are done of researchers, um, asking them which models of, of peer review um, they like best, that double blind always comes out as the, the favoured um, model. There was a survey done, I think, in 2009 by Sense About Science where that they, double blind was, was favoured. And much more recently, there's a Taylor and Francis white paper, which again came out as um, double blind being the, the much favoured one. And I think that's because on the surface, if you don't kind of l look into the process deeply, um, double blind appears to assess a lot of the problems that we're trying to address with open peer review. So you remove the, you re remove the bias, um, you, you make it a more objective review. But I think, unfortunately, the, the problem is um, it, it's not possible to fully blind um, they can always be, be guessed uh, who it is, so it, it turns it back to the single blind model. So I think that's why actually do, uh, open peer review is the, the answer to addressing those integrity issues. Uh, I would say that I think it's important to understand why the, the, blind, the anonymous review process has become dominant in the, in the field. And uh, the main reason, I would say, uh, for that is that it, uh, it makes the review process uh, uh, a question of favors, of doing a favor to the editor. And uh, this, this system of favors that this peer review actually today is exactly what uh, allows and also enforces the journal monopoly. Uh, supposedly, Nature is, uh, is doing the best peer review uh, that exists. But if it, was, if, it was, if it was signed, we would be able to question that. And this is something, something very important that cannot be jeopardized. So we, cannot, we could not have uh, signed reviews, but then, because then we would be able to compare the reviews of different journals and question the, the fact that they are performing the best review and that's why they deserve the prestige and the impact factors. Uh, so this is a, a very significant reason why we have this model. And if we don't want that, if we want to, to change to a different system, then we need, this is another reason why we need to make reviews open. Just if we if we looked, for instance, to the social sci science and humanities, I think that's a completely different situation. I think um, it's not possible to make a, a double blind peer review because a researcher usually, um, yeah, before publishing a monograph or so, after one or two years, um, so everybody knows. Um, 
in which field or on which, which topic he's working. Um, I think that's a complete variance of the life sciences and the medical sciences where you could uh, do successfully um, a double blind peer review. Um, and also blind peer review is difficult because the expert who is then yeah, uh, diving into that monograph or a manuscript um, is also, I think, could be easily identified from, from, from the author. So um, that happens, by the way, also in, in the natural sciences um, uh, sometimes. Uh, so it's not really blind peer review anyway. Another thing that uh, blind peer review enables is that the closed academic circles can decide what is accepted and what is rejected without being, again, this is not open to questioning from the rest of the community and criticism, which is another uh, positive for, for blind peer review. Okay, so we have a consensus here uh, around uh, the relationship between transparency and uh, the quality of reviewing. Uh, do we have it in, uh, in the room? Does it any, everyone is okay? I, I, I wonder why everyone thought uh, 10 years ago, maybe, <laughs> or still again, uh, that anonymity was related to, to quality. So it's like a magic. Yes, Ulrich. I would, I would still argue, I would, I would still argue that if you want to scale it up, uh, uh, one should really. Uh, consider allowing anonymity. So again, that's our experience. We allow it, right? And indeed, it doesn't go down uh, the, the proportion of people who choose anonymity. And I think there are many good reasons. So I think and in an ideal world, both double blind peer review and fully open peer review should work beautifully, right? In an ideal world, everything mm. would work beautifully. But, but in a real world, I think one should find the least common denominator, which you did, right? And I, because I think everybody talking about open peer review essentially now goes for making the review public together with the accepted article, more or less. There are also other cases, right? But maybe one should focus on jointly implementing this least common denominator and then try to go for making everybody also signing the comments uh, rather than enforcing both at mm. once. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Jean-Claude. And it will be the last remark on this subject. Yeah, I think it goes back to a remark I made earlier, and I think that intersects the distinction between commentary and review. Mm -hmm. um, if you're at the stage when you want to know whether a submitted paper or a piece of work should enter the territory of science, uh, it may be useful there for people to say yes or no, mm -hmm. and at the same time perhaps not sign directly what they, what they do. Although it would be, I think, very good to have the list of all those that were involved at that stage. If you're at the level of the contribution or the commentary, it seems to me that it falls under real common sense that mm -hmm. it, it should be signed. It's a contribution. So it should be part of the, yeah. uh, you know, the, the work of the grand conversation, as I like to call it, of an article starting to enter the fray of, of what the scientific and scholarly debate is all about. And in that regard, I don't think the distinction between social science and the STM domains is that very great. Mm -hmm. I think the same kind of debate, discussion, emendation, small corrections, and that kind of stuff, which is, must go on, uh, is, is important, very okay. important. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Okay, so uh, let's move on now to a more political or directly political question. Uh, uh, because for the moment, most of the reviewing process is under the control of publishers, uh, mostly private or commercial publishers. In fact, uh, it's the most important part of their added value and power in the communication system they, because they organize the evaluation. It doesn't mean that they do the evaluation because scholars do the evaluation, but they organize and it's the root of their power on the scholarly communication system, their ability to organize the, the, the reviewing. So now the challenge is how and why uh, to disentangle uh, peer review from journals or publishers or private platforms and try to organize it around the next generation of institutional open access repositories uh, with maybe overlay services. That was your question, Pandelis. Uh, so the question is what kind of infrastructure we need in this perspective and how we can make it sustainable and how a repository-based author and reviewer reward system could work. 
Vandelis, you have to answer your own question. <laughs> you shouldn't say that it's our questions. <laughs> so, okay. Um, if we think about what kind of infrastructure we need, I would say that what researchers need, what we need, is just a space to meet. And, uh, and that, that, should, that, should, that should be all. Uh, we should be able to meet at a common space and debate about uh, each other's works. And uh, this is what we do at conferences, this is what we do when we actually meet in, in person. And uh, now, I mean, we have the, we have the, the possibility of meeting uh, in cyberspace and it's easy and it's, and it's, uh, it's free. I mean, space in, uh, uh, on the internet is, uh, comes almost for free. So this is the basic infrastructure. And, uh, of course, around this, this space, if, if this space is provided, then we can have, we can have uh, when we say that uh, peer review is being organized, it doesn't mean that uh, it will, there will be no organization whatsoever, there will be chaos. Of course, uh, academic societies exist and they will, they will continue to exist. Uh, people are, be are being trained in specific research groups. These research groups have networks, have connections, they meet every year in their conferences. So these people can, when they meet in this space, they can arra arrange to, 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 to put their chairs together and start discussing with each other. The important thing is not to build walls around them, which is what we are doing now with uh, the current infrastructure. Being uh, not on the same place and being controlled by specific people who decide who comes in and who comes not. So what is important with this space is that, of course, these uh, societies and these groups will continue to do their work, and, but they will have also some free seats for people from the audience who would like, from other disciplines, from other rooms that will, be able, that will want to come and sit on, on the same table. Um, and so how this could work? Uh, we already have this space. I mean, that's what repositories have been doing for, for years now. They provide this space, but they don't know how to take uh, advantage of this space. They don't know how to, to, to to show the, the researchers that this could be the space where they could meet. And uh, there is a problem, of course, the, of the um, diversification, that uh, these repositories are uh, owned by institutions, they're, go they're governed by institutions, and there is no, actually there is no common place where they, where they, can, where they can meet. And this be, but this can be solved with, uh, with standard interoperability protocols that make irrelevant where the meeting is taking place, whether I put my research and my research is being commented on my repository, it would not be uh, it would be immediately harvested by a global platform where everything would be, where the discussion could, uh, could be discovered by, by other researchers. So what we're talking about is um, we can use the metaphor of having a cloud, having my, my music on the cloud and then I, I'm using various devices to get access to the same, uh, the, same, the same space, the same server where everything is stored and, I can, and everything is synchronized. So I may uh, perform some activity on my institutional repository, but at the same time, all, the, all my activity is signed and, uh, and transferred to the cloud. So repositories remain, retain their individuality, retain their, their infrastructure and their, as, as a portal, but they function as a portal in a common infrastructure that is, as I said, we have to make sure also uh, issues of governance of this infrastructure. When you create this space, actually there's no, uh, there's no need to pay anyone, there's no money involved. So all this can be, all this can be free, all this, when you don't um, establish the, the societies, when you do not uh, try to organize this peer review or say that you're organizing this peer review while in, in fact just there are already academic societies who do that for you, then there's no need to get any, to get any, any profit from the process. So this is the big strength of designing this kind of infrastructure because you you're not asking for money from anyone. So Stephanie, do we need to disentangle uh, peer reviewing from the publishers? Um, so in terms of kind of separating peer review from journals, um, I think there have, there have already been some um, initiatives uh, looking at doing that. So Peerage of Science, um, Axios Review um, conducts the, the peer review separately to, to the journal. So I don't, I don't think peer review has to be um, necessarily integral um, to the journal. I do think it's important, though, that we continue to make sure that, that, that peer review is meeting, the quali is meeting um, a quality that w we want. And I mean, my, my area is um, working um, in, our in our medical journals, and I think it's particularly important um, with medical research where an article is um, going to go on to inform um, clinical decisions that, that will be made on patients, that that report, ha that that um, manuscript has been um, reviewed by peer reviewers who are, um, 
able to assess um, the methodology, able to um, assess the statistics, um, and that we've got those full areas covered. And I think however we do that, we need to make sure that we are covering um, those bases. And I, I think at the moment that, that is a role that an editor can, um, can play well in that as an editor, I will make sure that I've um, got peer reviewers who cover all the important aspects of the manuscript between them um, to make a decision um, on those before, before that article um, is, is published. Um, and I think the, the other, um, the other um, issue is um, how to incentivize um, people to provide um, these reviews, these, these reports. We, we find that, that if manuscripts are particularly interesting, have a really exciting result, it's really easy to get peer reviewers to agree to review that article. But there's a huge amount of the sound science, important, valuable research that's going on that actually isn't as exciting um, to review. And I think we'd need to make sure we had systems in place to ensure that that, that was also um, going to receive um, adequate peer review. So Alexander, you worked at uh, many different uh, publishers' <laughs> place, so uh, I'm very curious about your opinion on that, and I have a specific question then uh, from the pr previous discussion. If, Stephanie, you agree that uh, it's not compulsory that the publisher organize and have the control over the peer reviewing process and can be done elsewhere, you, you said, uh, but if the publisher goes into this direction, what is his added value then? Um, yeah, I can give a clear answer. There's no need for any publisher or for a journal in principle. If you look very yeah, carefully into the history, how journals developed and yeah, how peer review, the peer review workflow, it's a workflow technically spoken, was developed, um, it made perfect sense in the age of printed journals, bounded issues, distribution by surface mail or airmail, if you're lucky. Um, but we have the digital age since two, two decades, and um, that's why we could consider a completely different workflow. And this is usually done if you're working uh, yeah, in a big company or in a smaller comp uh, company in industry. You should at least uh, from time to time look very carefully uh, to your internal workflow. Um, of course, we have done this, and uh, we are doing this at the university several times, also with my students, and bachelor thesis and master thesis, and yeah, we found out that in principle, there is no need um, to, to do that um, journal-based or print, journal, printed journal-based workflow anymore, um, and there is no added value. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of that question, um, the added value is um, managing the, um, the peer review process and providing a technical interface for, for doing all that stuff, since the reviews are done by us, by the scholars anyway. That's what you said. And if you know that Arius or Thomson Reuters, those two windows, these two windows are yeah, offering that system, that technical system to the publishers, it's not the publisher who is supporting the scientists doing this technically, it's Arius. Have you known Arius? Or, yeah. Yes. And, and so you could also set up your, your repository or use a repository or use your local repository at your institution as Thomson Reuters for a license, which is not so costly for a single journal or for a single um, whatever you want to call it, collection of papers. And then you could start doing everything yourself. And so we, we must agree that there is no longer any added value at this specific point from publishing industry and also copy editing and language edit editing, uh, it's done by, by mostly by Indian or, um, vendors. It's not done in the publishing houses anymore for most of the journals I have in mind now. And um, having said this, I like that idea. Simply look at repositories which still exist as, uh, for example, the archive with more than one million papers uh, in physics, mathematics, statistics, computational sciences, for example, and use an overlay structure. That's how it was called by Timothy Govers, the field medalist, mm -hmm. um, which said two years or three years ago in a blog post, uh, which was heavily and uh, frequently discussed afterwards. Um, just let's use this overlay principle, use a structure of communication, of quality assessment, of discourse, that was the expression, not peer review, discourse, to do that, what we have said in the beginning of that panel discussion, adding value, adding value to manuscript. 
supporting the author to improve the manuscript. And this could be, this could be easily done um, by those means. That's the situation. Okay, uh, any comment? Yeah. Um, I think these ideas are, uh, I worked myself eight years at Thomson Reuters before, so, so I think uh, the things what you're all saying is very well, but as I'm still working for One Science, which is a commercial open access, um, I just want to hear a little bit more about incentives, financial models, I love the philosophy, everything is for free and it's easy to make. I can tell you to build Scholar One or Arius, take some uh, consistent money to upgrade it. So my question to you is, can you talk, tell me a bit more about the incentives? Because my, con not my concern, but my thoughts were, when a certain article and a reviewer is named and he has to really start to review and it's open, will the cost not rise for that incentive? So I would just like to have a little bit more on the financial side. The philosophy, great. Technical, there's no issues there. But let's talk a bit about the cost. And the second thought is what I'm missing, but you mentioned it, is society publishers. Because on all fairness, you can't say a publisher. There are society publishers like American Heart Association. Will they be happy when they lose $5 million revenue per year? So that are the two little remarks I wanted to make. The last question maybe is not completely linked with the previous one, I think, uh, but I agree with the, the, your question about the financial cost of uh, taking in charge, in fact, the peer reviewing and the editing process. So to the panelists, maybe, yeah. Okay, the financial question. Uh, so I think the, the people in this group, we are enough to support this infrastructure by ourselves. I mean, paying like 10 euros every month. <laughs> And this would be enough. Why? Because one person has been able to create a platform that already exists and it's SJS, you can already join and start doing this process. The process doesn't have any costs. There is no team that will maintain the articles, that will organize review, there, no, there are no experts involved, nobody will look for reviewers. Authors can do that themselves and they're doing it actually. It's, yeah, so that's, are you satisfied with the financial? The, the answer to the financial problem. That's an important question. Sorry, I'm still so. missing the incentive there. Okay, incentive. So financially, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Since uh, from the business perspective, I, I completely understand your question. So uh, to be fair, of course there are costs. Also, if you, you want to create an environment and we are not charity publishing or doing this stuff, you need money from a funding or from the customer. And yeah, or from the EU or from the society, which would be a part of the answer to the, your last question. Um, but um, I think it's fair to say the added value could be um, yeah, a selective model where the author can select some service options uh, from yeah, a greater or a bigger variety of, of services options like copy editing, language editing. Consider the fact that maybe in the next 10 years, 40% of all publications will come in STM at least from China mainland and they are ready to pay, since they have the money, to pay extra money for language editing and copy editing to improve their article, their language of their articles. Of course they are not ready to pay some thousands bucks for that, but it's fair to say if you know the pricing, the pricings of the Indian vendors, you could say okay it's 10 bucks per printed page, um, I think that's 50% more than the big publishers are spending at the moment per page. So, that's a fair model. You click, yes, I want to pay 100 euros for 10 pager uh, for improvement of quality or not, and so on. And then you will create a sustainable model, and I think most in um, initiatives suffer from that fact so far, that there is no sustainability. That's why I agree completely with your question. And that's, if we are looking in the future, into the future, we have to consider sustainability for all initiatives, for all ideas, otherwise, otherwise they will sink to the ground as a bad paper. Okay, so um, really very short. Just a quick comment to, to come back to it. So I don't think there is any indication to see that neither open access nor open peer review would raise costs. On the contrary, there's a lot of reason to think that it should lower costs and enhance efficiency. And nevertheless, even though I have absolutely no vested interest in publishing, never made a single euro out of it, and I'm proud of that actually. So, uh, but uh, still, 
Um, I think there is a place for, for professional and also commercial publishers when they act as service providers, right? Which they do partly, the traditional publishers are partly service providers, but mostly they deny services that we want, namely open access. And if that changes, there is space for everyone and also for others. So I think it's important one big institution is good for the, like the streets and whatever, right? Or the, the water's piping system. But I think you do need actors to, to maintain efficiency. I think a functioning market, which we didn't have in the subscription system, but a functioning open access market is a good thing to make, keep things innovative and, and flowing. Okay, very short. Yeah, last just, just to realize that these services are already being offered outside the publishing uh, circle. So, for example, when I'm, uh, we have translation services. If I'm not uh, good with English, then I pay for translation. My group, my research group pays. Or, for, or to produce figures, or to all the, or for typesetting actually. So all these things can be totally independent of the actual process that we're describing. They can be outside from the from the cycle. So it doesn't need to be provided by the by the infrastructure itself. Or it can work in some kind of overlay uh, manner. But this is already costs that exist, and they're not calculated in the actual model. Translations are not ca calculated, for example. Or editing, they're professional editor. Almost every uh, decent research, uh, biomedical research group has their own editors, and they're paying them, and that's not related to the revenues of the publishers. They're outside this. Uh, okay. So we have solved the, the problem with the publishers. That's good. <laughs> no, because uh, there was a convergence, in fact, uh, through the discussion uh, with this idea of the publisher as a service provider. And open peer review could be one of the services or can be one of the services, but it's not compulsory, in fact. That's interesting. So. Uh, uh, Arvid and uh, Tony, don't be afraid, I have an eye on the clock. And uh, I'm going to now to merge the two uh, following questions, uh, which is uh, around the question of the uptake and the adoption by the different communities, scientific communities uh, of open peer review practices. So it's the question of incentives, but for the researchers this time. Um, um, uh, Stephanie, could you, could you give us your, your advice, your opinion on that? Um, what are the different levels of adoptions inside the different scientific communities and how we can work with that? Yeah, so um, as, I, as I mentioned in my talk at the beginning, um, while, I think, while I think the benefits of open peer review are very obvious, and in this room we're all very much in, in agreement on open peer review, when you go out and speak to researchers, that's often not the, um, the response you receive. Um, they're often very anti wanting to sign their reports, um, sort of put their name to, um, to, their, um, to their report. And I don't have an answer to how, how to solve all this, but I think there are a number of things that we could do to try and get to the, a position where um, peer review is a much more open process. Um, so I think... Um, I think more research into um, peer review, into the, into the quality of, of peer review, we can really sort of definitively ans answer the question as to whether um, open peer review um, is better quality peer review, not just looking at the quality of the reviewer reports, but I think it would be really interesting to do some kind of study to look at whether the final articles um, are better quality, because that's essentially what we're striving for, is not the quality of the report itself, but what peer review is adding to that article. So. That I think that would help um, because obviously research is like evidence, so um, we could use that to um, to try and um, engage um, people. But I think also um, getting out there and kind of working with communities and talking to researchers about um, our experiences of open peer review and that. The, the, the concern that no one will agree to review isn't founded because we've met, we, we run journals on open peer review and people do um, agree um, to sign them. And I also think possibly um, there is an argument in fields that are very um, not used to openly putting their name to, to criticisms to maybe um, look at um, a more stepwise um, process. So maybe normalizing publishing the reports um, to, with, with the option to sign, sign the reviews to then um, hopefully evolving to, to have a more open system because I think as much as we believe in the values of open peer review we can't impose it on researchers if that's not what they want we can't tell them that that's how they have to, um, to do it which I think brings me on to um, the second part of the question which I think was to do with incentivizing peer reviewers and um, peer reviewers are providing a really really important valuable service for free giving up their time so 
they need um, to be happy with the process that they're reviewing within, um, but they also need some kind of um, recognition. And I think that's an area that's becoming increasingly recognised that we need to reward peer reviewers um, for their efforts. And I think open peer review definitely um, enables that um, reward because instead of just saying, oh, I reviewed for that journal, but you can't see the report, uh, can take my word word for it that it was a good report. Your report is there in the open with your name on it. Um, people could go and look how good the quali how good your report was. Um, and I think um, and also things like uh, being able to assign a, a DOI to um, reports on open peer review also allows um, the next steps of, of credit to then come in. Um, and I think perhaps um, that might then help. Um, researchers um, gain recognition from, from their institutions for, um, for the time that they're spending um, on peer review as well as the time they're spending um, on their own research and the other activities that they're engaged in. Because of, in your opinion, for the moment it's not the case at all, no institution do recognise, do you have any example of an institution which try to recognise open peer reviewing practice, for example, in the assessment of research researchers? No, it's completely out of the blue for the moment. Yeah, okay, so uh, would you react? I would be happy if there would be some incentive. For mm. Since if you're sitting on a, on a rep report, uh, you spend uh, easily uh, half a day or so if you do your job quite accurate. And, um, but if you were summing up uh, finally at the end of the year, at, yeah, the re report for your faculty, that's what I'm doing every year, um, no way. I can say, ah, oh, I reviewed 20 papers or one, nobody cares about since I cannot prove it. I think that's the key issue. And the other question is, um, there were also ideas about um, uh, a reward system for reviewers which said, okay, let's pay them. Okay, and but it's an easy calculation if you consider an STM only, two million papers published, published every year, four million papers submitted, times at least two reviewers, 2.5 at average, so 10 million payments of, let's say, 100 bucks, 1 billion US dollars per year. That's quite a lot of money. And that's also what publishers said, ooh, that's a lot of money. Brackets, in brackets, of course, <laughs> they are earning 7 to 10 million, a billion um, uh, every year from the classical subscription system. However, it's 1 billion, and that's why it was, um, yeah, it was uh, thrown from the table then and uh, no, no longer considered. But I think having a DOI as a reward or incentive for the reviewer, a citable, something citable for myself as a reviewer, that would be a great advantage. And I think that's it's only possible if we open up um, the reviews, both the identity of the reviewers, the, otherwise I cannot prove myself as a reviewer of that specific article who contribut uh, contributed to the quality in the discourse. Um, I think that's the only way. That's why. So, okay, so we tend to, to always, uh, when, when we speak and when we think, to, 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 to say that the reviewers are being selected by someone and they're doing it for someone and this someone needs to recognize them. So it's like, I think we, we should aim towards a totally shift in this, in our, in our way of thinking, that the reviewers have, the, have to be the ones who select what they review. And this is where the incentives come. I choose to review this work because I believe that I can improve, the, improve its, uh, its quality. I think that I have something important to say to the authors. And if I actually do that, and if I'm correct in my estimation, then the authors will be delighted that somebody is coming and is helping them uh, to improve their work. And most probably, the next work will be in collaboration with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, uh, this, there can be no, no other, no, no, no better incentive than to open your research network, get uh, recognized by your, by your peers, and, and uh, bring new, new quality to, to research. So this should be the incentive. Then you don't need DOIs, then you, know, you just do what you're supposed to do. You're, you're doing your, your research and you're sharing it with your, with your others. Either from the point of view of the author, of the reviewer, of the editor, it becomes, it, 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 it gets mingled. There's no distinction between authors and reviewers. It's just people getting together and improving each other's work. This is, it's a community process. Oh, yeah. Okay, I thought you were just... We don't, oh, we don't have the culture and we don't have the infrastructure. How can it be the incentive? We have the infrastructure. I think we have the infrastructure. So we, uh, we know what? I can decide which paper I can review, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Or as a science author. Sure. <laughs> That's 
signs open, the platform we launched, you can use, yeah, you can take any out of the one million archive papers and say, I'm doing peer review right now. Or since last week, you can also choose among all these Cielo papers from Latin and South America to do this. So I think we have the infrastructure. We have the infrastructure in terms of the repositories or the classical journals, and we have the infrastructure, um, for, for example, the platforms, the Binover or, or Science Open, to do this. It's working, it's in place. Just use it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so uh, the question I, I, I give to the audience to, to, to close this discussion about the incentives is that uh, we have a discussion about uh, do, we, do researchers uh, do their research for their career or for the improvement of science or maybe for the two of them at the same time? What is your opinion regarding the incentives to participate to uh, open peer review as an improvement of quality? Just one, one okay. insertion about the, yes, of course, there is the Winnower, there is Science Open, there is SJS. When what, what are these, what are these uh, their private initiatives trying to convince people that they should use them? And that's what uh, mm -hmm. normally we're trying, <laughs> we're trying to do. But that's why, uh, this, is, this is the problem, that's why I'm talking about governance. That's why I, I think that it should be a federated uh, effort, a community effort. It cannot oh. be somebody trying to convince others that this is, the, the, this is your space now, this is where you should do it. Because there can be as many initiatives as, as, as money, as people who can gather around. So we should, we should come together and do this in a confederated manner instead of... There is, it's not. We can wait. I've been waiting for 10 years. This is an idea for Science Open. I think I started thinking about it 10 years ago. Where is the, where's the, the platform? Where can, where can I do it? There yeah, is yeah. no... That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can wait forever. Sorry if that won't be so open, but uh, that's why I've done it, or others have done it. Yeah. Just, I, I think it's also um, a way... It's not... It's not fair. Also, um, yeah, the effort of a PhD student um, doing it, yeah, himself, um, yeah. Josh. Josh. Yeah. Yeah. For profit versus nonprofit. Yeah. I mean, we're for profit. Yeah. Largely, not by choice, but by necessity. That's yeah. the only way we could get money. Yeah. We went to all the foundations and said, "Hey, you want to do this? No. Who are you? No. Who are you?" And there's a lot of money, but it's not easy to get it. Whereas if you kind of provide some financial incentive to maybe your backers down the road, you can create something. And so we wouldn't even exist. I know we could wait forever, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and, and you know. get no, no, no public funding. Yeah, unless yeah. we're still without. We are, we also. Okay, Jean Claude. Yeah, I'd like to go back again to that distinction between commentary and, and review, and this time uh, link it up with uh, two two elements. One of them is when you have disciplines where the rule is that you have dozens of authors. Uh, it seems to me that when these dozens of authors decide to go public, there is already a good deal of peer review that has been going on inside that team. And that, that's the first thing. The second thing is that when they go public, they go public through some channel. If the universities or research centers essentially gave the okay to go public, putting into the, the weight that the good name of the institution is at stake, and that if you don't do the right work, you're going to be punished locally by the institution somehow. Uh, it's going to enter in your evaluation. Then you have a system in which people are going to be very careful about what, they, what they're going to be putting out. And at the same time, this would be a corrective uh, for the present uh, institution system to just do counting, uh, the counting of, uh, of publication, which is nonsense, you know, we get into sausage, sausage slicing uh, sort of situations. Uh, and then after that, you've passed, in a sense, the phase of review, and you can go into the commentary phase. Hmm. You know. Okay. So, speaking of sausages, uh, I'm <laughs> terribly sorry to tell you that <laughs> we have to close this, uh, <laughs> this uh, conversation. Uh, uh, and I think we have enough uh, food for thought uh, to continue the conversation with the sausages now. Uh, I'm terribly sorry that we, we didn't have time to, to, uh, to go uh, into the topic of open science and open peer review, but it was too much, so maybe we should organize another uh, discussion Question about this specific topic because it's very important. I agree with you, Irina. Uh, thank you to all our speakers uh, for this conversation and all the ideas that you gave. Thank you very much. Thank you.